Hey everyone, welcome to Speak Now Pro Wrestling. I'm Denise Salcedo and today we are going to be chatting AEW All Out 2021. Guys, I do not even know where to begin right about now because I have legitimately, get this, I have not slept since yesterday at 8 a.m. I've been up since yesterday at 8 a.m. It doesn't even... I can't even fit it into my head. I literally have been nonstop just like in it, this whole vacation, not like workcation in Chicago has literally just been nonstop. So much work, so much going down. And I don't know if you guys can tell a little bit, but I am losing my voice because I did ring announcing at GCW. Then I also did karaoke for the first time. And then I kind of screamed super loud at C when CM Punk came out um, on, on the album out so i'm literally losing my voice too on top of all of this but we're here and today we're going to chat all things about AEW all out i'm going to give you guys a first hand uh look at the what happened what it was like to be there live at the show and you know got everything that i got to experience and we're going to talk about all of that we're going to talk about the post media scrum and i'm going to answer any questions that you guys have i'll tell you guys what i thought about the show all of the matches the big news that happened because we had so much news so much news that I mean, it was literally just like, oh my God, what is happening? Like being there in the arena and just kind of seeing everything that was happening, especially those final few moments of the show where you had all of these big major surprises. I mean, it was absolutely nuts everybody but before we get into that i do want to let you guys all know that this is a very interactive chat so make sure you guys send in some comments if you guys want to send in a super chat you guys can i will read your comment your question or statement on the air if you do uh, but let's go ahead and get started because oh my gosh okay guys our first super chat dude cameron mumford holy cow cameron mumford you are literally you did not have to do this btw but I want to thank you so much for this massive super chat. And I just want to say thank you. Holy cow. So Cameron sends in a super chat and says, All Out was easily the best pay-per-view I've seen in a long time. It truly reminded me why I love pro wrestling. And I was completely blessed to witness this. Every match and moment on the show ranged from good to effing awesome. And the crowd all night electric. So the crowd was definitely electric being there in the audience. Like the people were there. They were ready to have a good time. And here's the thing about this show, about All Out, and why so many people are praising it. So part of the reason why so many people are praising the show is because there was so much good in-ring wrestling wrestling okay so you have that you also have all of the surprises that went down on the show that's like another bonus on top of that but one of the things that I want to get across that maybe I don't know if it's being talked about right now since I haven't really been uh, reading what's been going on on social media and all of that but essentially I thought that the flow of the way that they booked the show I thought it ran, ran so smoothly to the point where, I mean, it was like, what, a couple of hours that we were there watching All Out. I seriously felt like I was there for maybe like an hour, two hours. Like the show completely flew by. Being there in person, it was kind of like, oh man, like what matches next? All right, I had to go to the bathroom and I literally had to pick like the best moment to possibly like run out there and go so that I wouldn't miss a thing. So like I thought that they did a really good job at making this show completely fly by. I mean, I think what we had like maybe 10 matches, nine matches. I forget now how many matches we had and it felt so fast where each match was just like, bam, 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 here we go. And then each match brought something so different to the the table where it was kind of like you got something different out of each and every single match. Now, the other thing that I want to add as to why so many people also love this pay-per-view, because even the matches that you can say, oh, maybe they weren't like the greatest matches. It didn't even matter because so many of those, like so many of the people on the card, so many of the talents are so over with everybody that you're just like genuinely excited to even see that person. I thought that the crowd definitely elevated so many of the matches that we saw at All Out. And again, we'll get into that in the little bit of more of a detail but I just kind of wanted to run through a little bit of like overall thoughts that I had about the crowd and how they essentially just like you know helped all out and just like the overall uh feeling for uh all out uh thank you so much to Cameron Mumford though for sending in this massive super chat I thank you guys so much and we're getting um a lot of super chats here and I'm gonna try to get Oh, I'm definitely getting all of those, but I'm going to make sure that um, I get to those first. We got one from Reggie Simmons who says that show was everything. Wow. I kid you not. I was 
jumping, guys. I was jumping like a child, like a child, especially those closing moments. So I know we're going to talk about this a little bit more in depth as we go on with this show. But when Adam Cole came out, it was like this big, like, oh, my God, I can't believe Adam Cole is here. And, you know, we're freaking out. And to be honest, I kind of thought that that was going to be like that was going to be the main surprise for the show or like that was like the the big surprise for the closing of the show, because we were all expecting a surprise for the closing. Right. I honestly thought that Adam Cole was going to be like, OK, cool, that's it. And then we're probably going to see, you know, Brian Danielson at some other point, you know, maybe at the Arthur Ashe show. A lot of people thought he was going to be there and so I thought that was it so then when you have Brian Danielson's music hit and then he comes out I am literally losing my mind and like I'm sure I haven't watched like the TV version I haven't watched any videos of how that reaction came across to the viewers at home but in person guys it was insane everybody was just like jumping and losing their minds and it was such a feel good moment where it was almost like you're getting so much like you were getting so much like you already had the surprises you know you had Minoru Suzuki who came out on the show that was a surprise you had Ruby Soho who came out on the show another surprise and then you have these two big ones in Adam Cole and Brian Danielson and yeah you know there were all these rumors and everything but you never know for sure until it actually happens and then even so with Adam Cole because you know we sort of been following you know all the different reports that people have been putting out about you know know, his conversations with Vince McMahon and essentially everything that's been going down with that. So you didn't even really know for sure if he was going to be there. So then you finally get this moment where you're just like, holy cow. And then you have, um, and I mean, okay, I'm going to get into more of that, but thank you so much to Reggie for sending in uh, this super chat guys. There is literally so much to say about this show. And, um, Just so much. Brandon Rosen sends in a super chat and says, how could I possibly watch Raw tonight after what I saw last night? I will gladly pay AEW for every pay-per-view that they put on for the foreseeable future. Yeah, you know, AEW pay-per-views are definitely, they're a little pricey, guys. Like, they cost a little bit of an arm and a leg. But I think for the most part, though, because you only have a couple a year, you know, they really do stack the card and they make sure that, they do a lot on that show. Like I mentioned, there's something for everybody and you, I feel you get your money's worth. I don't think that there's been a show where I'm coming out of it saying, you know what? I didn't get my money's worth for the most part. I always uh, feel like I got my money's worth. We got a super chat from Jose Vasquez who says, dude, thank you so much for your work. You are amazing. Totally pops when you ask Lucha brothers a question in Spanish. Yes. And for the post media scrum, I asked the question in Spanish. Um, I thought they were going to translate it, but I don't, they didn't. Um, But I asked in Spanish because I was like, okay, I I speak in Spanish and I feel like it would be rude to like ask them in English when obviously like I could say it in Spanish. So yeah, uh, I kind of, I was very happy that I was able to kind of have that like connection because uh, even if you don't speak Spanish and even if you didn't understand uh, what Penta told me afterwards, you could just see the raw emotion and like what he was saying. So it's, I mean, I'm going to get into that later as to what we actually talked about for those who don't speak Spanish. I'll do a little bit of a translation for what was said there, but either way, it was just like a really nice, a cool moment, a cool interaction guys. We got a super chat from Oliver via Roel who says one of the funnest pay-per-views I have ever seen that cage match was 15 out of 10 tag team effing wrestling highlight of the night was the mute Denise sign. There was a mute Denise sign guys. I could not get over it. I was sitting down kind of just like chilling and then Connor from comic book. He was like Denise. He taps me on the shoulder and he's like look over there and I was like what I look up and I was like holy shit that sign says mute Denise WTF. I was freaking out guys like legitimately I it was very cool to like see that and I just thought it was very awesome but yeah it was a very fun pay-per-view and I should add and I'm going to talk about this more when we get to the tag team match but the tag team match like you know usually when you have you know the steel cage and all of that you know sometimes for the people in the audience it's kind of hard to see what's going down I got to give them kudos guys it was super easy to see everything the cage was like a really like uh, the way that it was set up and like the way that it was like built and all of that it made it really easy for those that were in the live audience to be able to 
to be able to see what was actually happening in the ring, which was awesome because there's been so many times where I'll see a steel cage match and I'm like, I think I know what's happening, squinting my eyeballs and stuff. But thank you so much to Oliver for sending in the super chat. Uh, we got another one from Brandon Charles Powell who says, so happy for Ruby. She said she never heard her name chanted like that before and deserves it. So happy for Cole, Brian, Punk, and others who are going to have way more fun in AEW. So I'll say this much right now about Ruby, uh, Ruby Soho. So during that post media scrum, if you haven't seen the videos, if you haven't seen the footage, you will notice that she was very, she was, she, it took a lot of strength in her to kind of, you know, not like cry and get emotional because, you know, obviously and like in a good way, she had like these happy tears. Like she was excited. You know, she, she really put over this moment of how and what it meant to her to have this reaction from the crowd when she came out and just even the anticipation of people wanting her and chanting her name. And she kind of talks about that. And, you know, she was trying hard to, you know, not break down and start crying tears of happiness. So you could really see that. And here's the thing about, Ruby is that one of the things we've been talking about ever since her release and all of this is how much people love her and oh how nice she is and all of this I had never really met her before so I didn't know anything about about her or anything like that but even just like being in that post media scrum and just kind of, you know, being a couple like feet away from her and seeing the interactions that she was having with people and just even the way that she handles herself and the way that she presents herself you get this very, very uh, lovable vibe from her where you can't help but to say like, okay, that's a human right there that I trust. Um, so I just want to put over Ruby on that one really quickly. Uh, so thank you so much to Brandon for sending in um, that super chat right over there. And uh, we're going to get into the show, guys. I'm just going to get through a couple of these. We got another super chat from Brandon Rosen who says, big question for you, Denise, how were the nachos? I did not eat at the venue, ladies and gentlemen. I did not eat at the venue. I had a soda. Oh, wait, actually, hold on. I'm lying. I had the CM Punk ice cream. Guys, I had the CM Punk ice cream officially. Um, thanks. Shout out to Dominic who bought me the ice cream. Uh, he he brought me that. He bought me the ice cream, and I started eating it before the show. And I didn't realize I'm a messy eater, everybody. So I'm eating the ice cream, right? And it's like starting to melt, and I'm like trying to get it all in. And then it's so it's essentially like it's it's vanilla ice cream, but it's chocolate covered, and like the pieces are the the chocolate portion is obviously cold, obviously. So like the pieces start to break off, and I was like dropping chocolate like all over the place having vanilla on my face but it was really good guys like I'm not even kidding you I'm not even that big of a, like an ice cream person or an ice cream lover but that ice cream was legitimately delicious and usually when you have ice creams like at these types of places these concessions and all of that they're not good and and you know CM Punk did seek out an actual place to do these ice creams for them um they were they were legit. They were good. Uh, we got another super chat from Matt Raquel who said Raquel who says, uh, "Always a pleasure meeting you again, Denise. I'm still on cloud nine. Lost my mind on Adam Cole and then Brian Danielson. Dude, it was great to meet you again this weekend. Really fun. Uh, I got to meet a lot of really awesome people. It was really cool. A really cool vibe, guys. Everybody was just like, you know." Everybody was just there having fun and everybody was there. I don't know what else to say. Like people just wanted to have a good time. And, you know, I was talking to people and people were just like saying how cool it was to be around people that are wrestling fans, and getting to talk to people that, you know, we haven't seen in a very long time. So this was like a very big reunion and also a like first time to meet lots of different people. Uh, so thank you so much to Matt, who just asked uh, this question right over here. Uh, we got another super chat from Justin P who said, Says, Hi, Denise. This is the first time I'm watching your show live. Thank you for all the hard work and the attention and, and detail you put in. All out was amazing. Thank you so much, Justin. I appreciate it. Uh, you have no idea. Um, I do wish that my voice was a little bit better and I wish I wasn't as exhausted, but I feel like uh, because there's just so much good stuff to talk about the show and so much to say that I'm like, all right, like I'm hyped now. Like I'm hyped. Like I'm here and we're talking about it. So thank you so much for uh, watching the show live. We got another super chat from Sebastian. Uh, Mikulik, who says, I've been watching wrestling since the late 80s. This was the best show I have ever seen. I haven't been this happy to be a fan in at least 20 years. Wow, that is seriously incredible. And here's the thing is that I do want to put over AEW on this because they have done a really good job at 
getting the fans to trust them, getting the fans to trust their booking decisions, and just essentially gaining that trust from the audience. And we had so many different examples of this. But I think one of the major examples is really the fact that, you know, the main example that I want to get at with this is that a lot of people thought it was going to be Kenny Omega versus Hangman Page at AEW All Out. It did not end up being Kenny Omega and Hangman Page. It ended up being Kenny Omega and Christian Cage. However, A lot of people, even though some people, you know, they were a little disappointed in that, they still, a lot of people on Twitter were writing to me like, yeah, maybe I'm not, you know, as interested in this match because I thought it was going to be Hangman Page. But a lot of people kept telling me, I trust AEW and I trust in the decisions that they're going to make. And given that the way the show ended, I don't think anybody, as much as we all love Hangman Page, I don't think anybody was necessarily disappointed with that ending of the show. If anything, I felt like I, I had too much. I got too much like Christmas. It was too big, too many gifts from Santa Claus, too many. Um, That's kind of how it felt, you know? So I do, you do see that trust from the audience. And that was one of the things that, that, um, I wanted to talk about Tony Khan in the media scrum, but we didn't, uh, but I, I just didn't bring it up, but you kind of, you did hear it in other questions though, because it was sort of touched on a little bit where like, he is aware of the fact that, you know, people are reacting obviously in a very positive way to AEW. And that was something that CM Punk even spoke about when he was there with Tony. And he was basically saying like, look, our competition is the fans. And by that, he means that, they're making sure that the fans are interested in the product and they're trying to focus their efforts on not necessarily, you know, just watching what, you know, the competition is doing, but also making sure that they are putting their best foot forward to gain that, gain that, um, that attention, gain all of that attention from, from the actual fans. So I thought that was a pretty cool way to look at it, a unique way to look at it because I hadn't seen it that way. Um, so thank you so much to Sebastian for also sending in uh, this super chat over here. And I'm going to scroll through a couple more. We got another one from James Barris who says, Denise, whenever there's a Spanish speaking audience, Penta seems to be the talker of the tag team. How charismatic, how charismatic is he on the mic? So If you did not watch that scrum, BTW, it is up on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Denise Salcedo. Penta, if you understand Spanish and you listen to what he says, it is hilarious. So AJ Awesome, uh, you know, little boy, uh, I don't know how old he is, but I'm assuming he's smaller than 10 years old. Little boy. He, He asked him a question. I forgot what the question was, but he essentially Penta kind of started going off in Spanish about the meaning of the mask and basically telling uh, telling AJ like, hey, you know, I wear this mask because it makes me feel like a, he didn't say superhero, but he says it gives him like superpowers. Like he feels like a different person. The mask transforms him in a different person. And then he literally just makes a joke and he goes, I'm not wearing this mask because I'm ugly. Like, don't think that we're ugly. Like, that's not why we're wearing the mask. And I swear to God, I just popped so hard for that. And the guy next to me who also spoke Spanish, popped hard for that. So, and I did hear a couple of chuckles from the media room. So it was like one of those things where like, there is so much charisma and there was a lot of things that they said that I thought were pretty funny. And that was one of those moments there. So yeah, Penta is very charismatic and very, very, uh, very funny, uh, very good personality. And, and same thing with Ray Phoenix, because, you know, I've had conversations with Ray Phoenix. I've had several interviews with Ray Phoenix and he is somebody that, uh, it's just very easy to talk to and very down to earth. Uh, we got another super chat from Thomas Shevlin who says, my friend and I lost our damn our damn minds at the surprises. Soho, Suzuki, Cole, and Danielson. I've got goosebumps almost 15 hours later. Bring on dynamite. Dude, I'm running on goosebumps. If you, for those of you who are just tuning in and missed when I said this at the top of the stream, I have not slept since yesterday at 8 a.m. Yesterday, guys, at 8 a.m., I'm dying to go to sleep. But after this, I got to eat dinner and then I got to watch Raw and then I got to do the post show. No time for sleep. Uh, but thank you so much to Thomas for sending in uh, this super chat. We got another one from Russell Handel who says, uh, your media scrum footage was awesome. Great sound and great camera spot. Yours was the best coverage by far. Thanks for everything you do. Thank you so much. Um, I know it's easy to get the footage up faster if you do it on a phone. BTW, I did have to do the Tony Khan one in a phone because I my battery died. My DSLR battery died. And 
it was too complicated and I didn't have time to change the battery. It was like a whole thing. I barely had enough space to move. So I couldn't really like bend down in the middle of that to like take out all my stuff and take out the battery. So I last minute had to do like the last, the last portion with Tony Khan on my phone. But anyways, it is easier to get the footage up, but I do like taking the time. I rather have it go up a little later and have the actual like, you know, as decent footage as I can possibly get, you know, with my DSLR and all of that. So yeah, I thank you guys so much for watching those videos. Uh, those are all up right now on the channel on my YouTube channel. And they literally I think almost all of them are over 100,000 views right now. There's I think Brian Danielson one has like 1500 comments because people are just so excited to talk about what went down and just like everything guys like everything because this is one of the things that I tweeted out to I put this out on Twitter and I was like dude the perception right now for AEW looks and feels very strong uh from the outsides looking in they're getting these like big names you know you have CM Punk who's somebody that was so adamant that he wasn't going to return to wrestling somebody that was essentially so uh you can say you know he was burnt and you know Eventually, you know, you, you can even argue maybe, you know, he lost a little bit of that passion, but, you know, he refound it or is refinding it here and now. And so you got that. You got the fact that you got Adam Cole, who literally could have been somebody that could be made, could have been main eventing if they wanted to in WWE for years. Uh, you have somebody like uh, Brian Danielson, who is just so beloved across the board from wrestling fans. Like you never hear people say bad things about him. You got Minoru Suzuki. You got so with that. Like you have the symbol, you have the, you know, he symbolizes that working relationship with New Japan Pro Wrestling. So there you go. Like uh, Ruby Soho. I, I mean, it's just so much like everybody. I feel uh, every person that you see going to AEW or you see doing something with AEW, I feel add something different to the table, but also provides a different uh, perception to a different perception to like kind of like a different meaning, like what they stand for, kind of like what I just went through right now, where if I'm looking at this and I'm thinking to myself, like, man, you know, Tony Khan was able to convince CM Punk to come sign with the company, et cetera, et cetera. And they do talk about that a lot more in the media scrum, which I will get into in a second. Uh, we got a super chat from Labor Days who says, just want to say thank you for all your hard work. Hollywood well deserved success. It was nice to meet you as well at GCW. Thank you so much, man. It was so cool to meet so many of the fans and like people coming up to me and we're like, there was people coming up to me and they were just like, calling me Hollywood. And I was like, hell yeah, this is great. Uh, it was very, very uh, fun. Uh, GCW was great. Um, shout out to Brett, who literally like gave me a chance and has been giving me a chance to like do some ring announcing. Uh, so shout out to him as well, because uh, that was really great. Uh, we got a super chat from Nick Grasso who says, Adam Cole, baby. Brian Danielson. Yes, yes. And let's not forget Ruby Soho. What a night for pro wrestling. WWE made such a mistake letting these talents go. Um, well, not I mean, they bypassed, they they kind of forgot the whole thing with, you know, the contract situation with Adam Cole, Brian, you know, they're, and they're, you know, essentially their contracts ran out. And Brian Danielson did say this in the media scrum. He did very, he talked about his relationship with Vince McMahon. And he basically said he has a good relationship with Vince McMahon. And, you know, he respects Vince and, and, you know, Vince cares for him a lot. And that was one of the things that he touched on that he felt Vince McMahon is a little too protective of him. And he kind of compared this to marriage. So he used this like uh, this metaphor where he said that, you know, in marriage, you're kind of like, you know, you're safe and all of this, but you kind of want a little bit of that wild side. And so he kind of compared AEW to being that like wild thing. Like, yeah, he had this like really good thing here with like WWE and all of that. But at the same time, like it felt safe, like he needed something different, something to challenge him, something to bring some Thing new to him and so that is something that he touched on with uh you know it's signing with AEW but he also said that WWE did make him a generous offer he, he didn't go into details on to how generous that offer was but he did say that it was generous and they were willing to let him do uh, outside things outside things out of WWE now I don't necessarily know if that meant like going to do matches with like another promotion 
or if it meant like him doing like, you know, I don't know, like Twitch or something like that. And he didn't emphasize, he didn't really explain that portion of it. So I guess like make what you will, what he meant by that. But he did say they made him a generous offer and that they were going to allow him to do things outside of the company. So it, it, so he didn't, he did not bury WWE whatsoever. Like he did not do that guys. He really like, yeah, he did say like he, he, he talked about, you know, pro, being a pro wrestler first and, and main force all uh, mainly always, but he did say, like you know when I took pro wrestling everywhere with me he never mentioned like leaving pro wrestling even when he was in WWE uh you know something that is more considered sports entertainment uh he didn't bury them whatsoever and same thing with Adam Cole Adam Cole did not bury WWE either um I think that I think a lot of people automatically expect everyone to have this bad experience but these like I, I urge you to go and listen to these like interviews because in there you get more of a different perspective and what that talent actually went through and how they explained their decisions as to why they decided to leave WWE. And I think sometimes we all think it's like one reason, one reason only, uh, you know, all of that. But they really did go in and explain that a little bit more where you're thinking, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. And it didn't feel like, I didn't feel at all that Adam Cole or Brian Danielson were bitter whatsoever. Hell no. Like 0% of that. They legitimately were thankful and respectful of their time there. And they were respectful and thankful for their next chapter in their careers. And I thought that that was pretty, I, I thought that was pretty fine. Like I like that. And we'll talk more about, you know, Daniel Bryan and the things that he said uh, when he went um, off camera afterwards, because he did go into like a really um, long speech. We got a super chat from from Puma Warrior 13, who says, um, skip Ron, get some sleep. Also, how do you get out of the venue with no Uber or Lyft? So that's another thing that we do need to talk about, guys, because the now arena. So on my SummerSlam stream, I buried Allegiant Stadium. Well, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to bury the now arena. The now arena was worse than the Allegiant Stadium, guys. Worse than Allegiant Stadium, okay? So I'm going to give you guys the breakdown here on the now arena. All right. This is why I thought it was worse than Allegiant Stadium for me, at least. OK, so, well, this is for everybody. Their Wi-Fi was terrible, guys. Terrible. And I mean, terrible. It took me, I'm going to say maybe five to 10 to 15 minutes to send out one tweet a lot of my tweets if you were noticing were coming really late after things had already happened like I was tweeting about a match that happened two matches ago because I was literally just there waiting for the dang tweet to send it was horrible and get this I had a special media uh I had a special media wi-fi login and password and all of that and nobody in the media section was getting like instant like you know, tweeting gratification, like everybody was trying to like tweet and send photos and upload videos. And we couldn't even do that. Uh, so that was a very big bummer. Because as you guys know, one of the main things that I do is tweet during these shows. And so like, I kind of felt like that was taken away from me. Although here's the weird part, though, there were certain moments that I would get internet. So get this, I would only get internet and I could send tweets really fast. Whenever there was an entrance theme playing, don't ask me why, don't ask me how, but this was something that I noticed whenever somebody was coming down the ring or somebody was leaving, that was when I got the best internet reception and I was able to like actually shoot a couple of tweets that were like in real time, but it was just like terrible. I couldn't see any of my notifications. I missed all of that type of stuff. So I was I was pretty upset about that. And secondly, to answer your question about uh, the Ubers and the Lyfts, guys, people were stuck here. So keep in mind that they're promoting Chicago, Illinois, uh, Chicago, Chicago, this and that. We ain't in Chicago. We're in Hoffman Estates, all right? That's where uh, the Now Arena and all of that went down, all of that whole stuff. There were no drivers available people were there waiting for hours to either get an uber or get a lift i was there i couldn't even get a driver like i couldn't get a driver like the option wasn't there whatsoever you couldn't get a taxi you couldn't get an uber you couldn't get a lift people were walking 
back to their hotels. People were calling friends for rides. There were some people that I think were going back and forth trying to give people rides, but people were stranded. My fiance saw two couples legitimately fight, like pushing and shoving each other just to get into a car. So that should kind of tell you guys a little bit of like how insane all of that was. Uh, eventually, shout out to Tony Leader, who was able to come and pick us all up. So he literally saved us. Uh, he picked us up. And as we were driving back to our hotel, I felt so bad because I was literally seeing people like walking in these terrible roads with no lights. I'm talking like just the roads and bushes, everybody. And there was just people, you know, like walking there by themselves. And to walk, even though it wasn't that far, to walk to our hotel, it would have been an hour and a half to walk. Keep in mind, this is like one something in the morning, okay, like almost 2 a.m. And so like to walk that distance would have been insane. So um, and that definitely sucked. And a lot of people were I saw a lot of people respond to my tweet because they were stuck in a similar situation where they were canceling rides, etc. People it, it was it was kind of like it was bad. Yeah, I wouldn't it was not a great situation to be in there. Uh, we got another super chat from Marcus Chat. Marcus Coy, excuse me, who says, hey, Denise, keep killing it. I, uh, I did watch the post media scrum. Love your question. You asked uh, Tony, uh, Tony Khan about signing co competitive bookers and need to trust their guts. Uh, competent bookers need to trust their gut. Yes. So I asked Tony Khan uh, essentially about when you have these new talents available. I didn't want to say WWE releases. So I kind of worked around that. I said, when these chunks of talent suddenly become available, how do you essentially decide who are you going to sign? Who are you not going to sign? Especially when you have social media saying, sign this person, Tony, sign this person, Tony, like what factors into his decision making as to whether or not to sign people? Because even one of the things that Ruby Soho was talking about during her media scrum was when she was saying, yeah, that after she got released from WWE, she was heartbroken. And, you know, she had to close that chapter of her life. But the thing that she wanted to say, too, is that she wanted to go to AEW, but she did not know if there was a place for her in AEW. She had no idea. And so like, there's a lot of that going on where it's like, yeah, a lot of people want to go to AEW, but is there a place for you in AEW? So that was one of the things that I talked about with Tony Khan. And, and you know, he really just talks about, you know, he, he says like, just because I don't sign somebody doesn't mean that he doesn't like them. He doesn't sign them because maybe he doesn't have a place for them on on his roster. And so he kind of talked and explained a little bit more about that and essentially how, um, how he really makes his decision. So it was kind of cool to, you know, get a little bit into the mind of Tony Khan and how he decides all of those things. Uh, we got a super chat from Justin P who says, Denise, remember Tony Khan tweeting out the balance of power and wrestling will shift all out, put a stamp on that. The more the company builds trust with their fans, sending positive vibes from South Africa. Thank you so much for watching all the way from South Africa. And yeah, I remember that tweet because that tweet ended up being very controversial because people were like, bro, like you said you were going to shift the powers in wrestling. And then all of a sudden, like you did, like people were expecting it like that night or like that coming show. And then it didn't happen. Even me, I was like, what the hell? Like, why would he tweet that when the, the, nothing even happened? And then he later explained in an interview, I forget which interview I was listening to an interview where he was talking about this. And he basically said like, he kind of like, or maybe it was a media, media call, whatever. But he basically emphasized that, hey, like he didn't mean like, during a short period, like he meant during like long term, uh, the, you know, you're going to see a shift in um, a shift in the power or, or the shift of the balance of powers and all of this. You guys remember the tweet. Uh, so thank you so much to Justin for sending in uh, this super chat, guys. Um, BTW again, for those of you who are coming into the stream, I'm running on very little sleep. So sorry if my brain power is a little bit um, terrible. Uh, we got a super chat from Brandon Rosen who says, I saw your clips from the post show presser. These debuting stars may not have buried WWE, but boy, did they all sound so freaking happy to be in AEW. They really did. They honestly really, um, they really did. Okay, guys, I'm trying to catch up because I still got to run through the show. Um, Sean says, um, Sean Sirianni says, Brian Alvarez Wi-Fi was hilarious. A minute, a minute ahead of the pay-per-view stream, I was spoiling surprises for people. LOL, I had to stop going on Twitter. His Wi-Fi was working while he was in the second row. So they probably had like way better Wi-Fi. They probably had like a different like Wi-Fi access, but like us in the jobber seats, 
the section one, well, section 105 is not job receipts whatsoever, but it's not second row. Um, but yeah, we did not have the luck that Brian was having with the Wi Fi. Uh, I'm so jolly. I'm so jolly. Um, BTW, thank you so much to man meet Rana who sends in a super chat. Didn't send in a comment, but I appreciate you uh, taking the time to send in this super chat. All right, guys, I'm officially all caught up with these super chats. So let's finally go through this show, everybody. Oh my God. All right, so let's get into this. Um, and also, as I go through this, if I forget to mention something, um, please, um, please ask me a question because sometimes I might forget to say something. Also, I'm not going to run through things move by move because um, you guys saw the show. We're going to kind of go through some of like the main portions, really. Um, and now Steve Fuentes says in a super chat and says, help, Denise, how can I tell if I'm a casual or a diehard? All out was the S word. Keep putting up the great work and take over F4W. Um I would I don't know. I don't know if you, how you can tell if you're a casual or a diehard. I think you can just kind of tell. Uh, but thank you so much to Manuel for sending in uh, this super chat. Thank you so much. All right, here we go. So the pre-show match, guys, uh, Best Friends and Jurassic Express, they defeated the Hardy Family Office. Uh, this was honestly a very fun match. And the thing that I really want to stress to you guys, and I'm sure you know this. I mean, we all kind of knew this just from watching on TV, but... Jurassic Express is just so, so damn over. I cannot put into words how exciting it was to have everybody in the crowd waving their arms, singing along to the theme song. It was just so much fun, and the people loved them. Uh, everything that they did, people were just so invested in this. I think it was the right way to kind of kick off this match. The second that they came out, that's when I realized, oh, it's going to get loud in here. Once I started to get like a little glimpse of how people were going to be, like what their levels were going to be in the arena, oh, you could tell, like just with Jurassic Express, like people were like, losing it and obviously they popped harder for other people on the show but still it was pretty fun there um but the thing that i want to get at here is we got a uh return of the butcher guys i'm a fan of the butcher and the blade they're so much fun uh but the butcher has been out of action since about april uh thumb injury so several months now but he came back um and so it was really good to see him back here. Uh, you know, he realigns himself with the Blade and the rest of the Hardy family office as they essentially uh, do a post-match attack on Orange Cassidy. So this was good stuff. I think people were happy to see him back as well because, again, fun stuff. And, you know, the last time that we saw him, uh, yeah, I think the last time that we saw him, he was in uh, – a match against Darby Allen. So it kind of felt like, you know, he was, you know, getting this, this opportunity to sort of, you know, show what he can do outside of the butcher and the blade. But then unfortunately, you know, he gets injured. And so he's gone from there, but this was a really fun way to kick off the show. Everybody. And uh, we got a comment from Justin P who says butcher and the blade is now complete question. The mark says, glad the butcher is back. They are an excellent team. Um, 100% guys. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and move on. So next match, we had the opening match of the card was for the eight, WTNT championship Miro defending his title against Eddie Kingston and successfully retaining so I thought this match was fine but I do think that this is one of the matches that was definitely elevated more so by the crowd because the crowd was like eating this match up and the thing is that like people ha have been liking what they've been doing with Miro we've been getting this very like killer version of Miro and people are digging it but then at the same time like people were popping so hard for Eddie Kingston like there was a moment where I thought man it, it seems like the people want Eddie Kingston to like definitely win this title even though for me it felt like we I was 100% positive going into this match that Miro would be retaining like I didn't think Eddie Kingston would be winning here tonight and so I kind of felt like everybody kind of thought that but at the same time it's like Eddie Kingston is over, period. So because he is so over, the people are just going to be like reacting. Even if they don't think he's going to win, they're still going to be reacting in this manner because he is that just over with the crowd. And that's where I want to get at too. I said this at the top of the stream, but there are so many uh, people here that are over with the crowd that people are excited to see them and to see what they're going to do. Um, so I really like this. I like the story that they told with Kingston going, uh, you know, working Miro's neck, neck, excuse me. I like that. The only thing that I was not completely uh, crazy about was uh, leading up to the finish. We saw essentially 
uh, interaction here with the referee that I was not that crazy about. We saw that Eddie Kingston had a visible pin. He was about to get a pin, one, two, three, et cetera. But Bryce Remsburg, the referee, essentially gets, uh, he's, he's, he's distracted by putting back the, uh, the pad on the exposed turnbuckle. And so he isn't able to count that that pin and so people were kind of like you know getting on him for that and he was kind of just like oh you know it is what it is like kind of doing that sort of thing and so I wasn't necessarily crazy about this because I didn't think that they needed this spot in this match like this was a hard hitting match and they the people were into it to the point where you didn't need to do this and then later on on the show we did have another moment where uh we also had the referees involved in the decision making of the match in terms of kind of like messing things up so I didn't necessarily like that they did this at the top of the show and then we saw it later on play off in the MJF Chris Jericho match which we'll talk about uh, in a moment here uh, but we did end up seeing Miro win this match a uh, right call to have Miro win guys Miro right now is on fire in terms of like, we're finally getting to see the Miro people have been wanting to see. I think he's on another level right now. We're seeing him do new things that we haven't seen before. And I also do not think that they've like completely scratched the surface with him. I still think that there are so many different matches, different challengers that he can have to kind of really build this really strong TNT championship run. One of the things that I've been talking about on my show, and I'm going to repeat this now, is that Darby Allen, I thought that his reign as TNT champion was absolutely phenomenal. I mean, there were so many matches that he was having consistently week to week, back to back, where I was just like, man, it doesn't matter what opponent he's in there with. He's having these killer matches and look at what Darby's doing now. And so like I'm looking at Miro's reign and I'm kind of like, you know, unfairly sort of comparing it to Darby Allen's reign. And even though I like Miro and I like what he's doing right now, I don't think it's anywhere near Darby Allen's TNT title reign yet. And I think that they could do that. And this match with Eddie Kingston was definitely a good um um, a good win for him here. So, um, so yeah, I didn't think that that whole thing with the referee was necessary here, but for the most part, um, this was a pretty fun way to kick off the show. Uh, we got a super chat from Christopher uh, Jazz Cat who says, I was excited for Ruby. I lost my mind when Suzuki showed up. I was shocked to see Adam Cole and overjoyed to see Brian Danielson wrestling is the best. You see, like, everybody is set in such a good mood, everyone. Like, that is, um, that really is. That, that's just like the mood that everybody's in like everybody's excited like I'm like that's what I've been saying like I'm here you know my voice is practically gone I haven't slept I'm starving while I'm on this and like I'm still like excited to be here and talk to you guys about this night because it felt so cool and then even afterwards in the media scrum I wasn't expecting for us to get to talk to everybody like they brought in CM Punk Adam Cole Brian Danielson Ruby Soho the Lucha Brothers I was expecting maybe just like usually it's always Tony Khan I was expecting Tony Khan perhaps CM Punk I was expecting maybe just Britt Baker and maybe that was it like I wasn't expecting all of these people and so when they brought them out I was like hell yeah like this is cool and I kind of thought it was just like it was a really fun, a really fun thing here. A really fun thing. Um, all right, guys. Uh, let me see what else we got here. Uh, we got so many people sending all types of different comments here, guys. So many different stuff. We got a comment from Hibumaro, who also believes that Miro Rutini was definitely um, the right decision here. Uh, we got Ricky saying, I'm so happy Miro won last night. Something, uh, something WWE made a mistake, had Miro as a big monster heel. And also, where is Lana? Well, I do not know. Uh, I do know this, though. Lana has a lot of personality. And if she were to go to AEW, I think that she would add a lot of uh, a lot of pizzazz because the girl has a lot of personality. Russell War says um, this Miro is a million times better than the comedy act he was forced to do in WWE. He looks like a big badass. Let him be a big badass. Not that hard. But see, I didn't necessarily hate. Look, I did not hate him being like this comedy act in WWE because it did get him over. Like the people were invested in him. It's not like they weren't invested in him. People did like him. And I liked everything that he did with Lana and, you know, Rusev Day and just all of that type of stuff. Um, I was definitely a fan of all of that. 
Um, all right, guys, let's move on here. Um, we're going to go ahead and move on to John Moxley uh, defeating Satoshi Kojima. This was another fun one because we had a big surprise, a very unexpected surprise occur after this match. But before we get to that, let's talk a little bit about this match. So um, first and foremost, in terms of like crowd reaction, I thought that um, – the reaction for Kojima was a lot bigger than I had anticipated. So that was kind of cool to see that the people were like, hell yeah, like they were excited guys. And this was what you expected it to be. You were expecting it to be a hard hitting match. And that was exactly what it was. It was a good worked match. The crowd was into it. My favorite part was obviously seeing all of those chop exchanges between both of them, because that's always really exciting when you get that back and forth, especially with, you know, guys that have that like, like that presence and that attitude and you just get all of that like you know I don't even know how to describe it um they also protected they also protected protected Kojima during this because you did see John Moxley in order to get the win he had to hit two paradigm shifts and to be honest they didn't even have to do that so I kind of felt that them doing this was kind of like a nice thank you uh thank you you know to Kojima thank you to you know also the fact that the later on that we would have Minoru Suzuki coming out so this was kind of like a cool way to you know protect him as well so I cut I like the ending I liked all of that so let's talk about the moment Moment where everybody was just like the crowd was just chanting holy shit and like I was taking pictures and like if you go back and you look at the picture that I posted you only see the back of John Moxley's head but the stare in Minoru Suzuki's eyes guys like he is just like this man does not mess like it is there's so many people that in wrestling that pretend and act like they're mad, but they don't really come across as mad or you don't really buy it or you kind of have to like to spend your disbelief a little bit to believe it. Hell no. With Suzuki, you look at him. He's a terrifying man. You would not want to be in the ring with him. He will kill you. He will kick your ass. He is a badass. OK, he is a badass. And that is exactly what you got from here. And so you had. Uh, so he makes his way down the ring and everybody's like losing the shit. They're their shit. The second his ma his music hits, he confronts John Moxley, who's like all surprised. Uh, he takes off his shirt. He gets in Moxley's face and then they literally start trading um, forearms and then they brawl until Suzuki. Uh, hits him with a gotch pile driver and lays him out. This was an unexpected surprise that just felt like an incredibly um, awesome moment. And here's the thing is that I, I don't know if I said this on, I forget which show I said this on, but I was talking about one of the good things that AEW is really good at is they're really good at creating moments. And I've said this, I forget on which show, but I said this. And this was a perfect example of that. This was a perfect example of having this unexpected moment, this unexpected surprise, and essentially just turning it into something totally, uh, again, unexpected that people didn't see coming. Uh, and then... Here's the other thing, though. So you have this like stare down here with with uh, Minoru Suzuki and John Moxley, and you finally have them go at it with each other. And I'm thinking to myself, OK, like I was mentally preparing, like, OK, like what am I going to ask Tony Khan afterwards during the scrum? I was going to ask him, like, hey, are we going to see more of Minoru Suzuki on on Dynamite? Like what's going to happen? But then shortly after, uh, very quickly, actually, they announced that he would be on Dynamite and that he would be facing John Moxley uh, during the John Moxley's homecoming. I mean, show. Um, here's the thing, though. I will say this. I am curious as to how quickly this was decided in terms of like not qu how quickly this was decided, but maybe like. It just seems to me that this came about so fast. At least that's how it seems like it, because I almost feel like they should have done John Moxley versus Minoru Suzuki at AEW All Out and instead reversed it and then had this match with Kojima on Dynamite. So that's where I'm wondering, like, when was this decision made? Because I almost feel like they could have done it the opposite way, the opposite, uh, the opposite way, because there were some people that were like they were expecting somebody else for John Moxley to face. And some people were they were some people were a little bit let down by the Kojima reveal. Um, so I do think that obviously if it had been promoted as Minoru Suzuki on this like big scale paper 
pay-per-view. I think it would have been like a lot more awesome. But then again, I don't know when Minoru Suzuki got into the United States. I don't know when these decisions were made or any of that. So I think like all the timing is probably what's key here and why we didn't actually get to see this match at all out. But at the same time, I liked the surprise because a lot of the surprises that we saw, they were already names that were being thrown out there. Like we had already thought of Ruby and Adam and, and you know, Brian Danielson and all of that. Like those were expected at some point. I don't necessarily think many of us were, uh, you know, expecting to see Minoru Suzuki uh, appear here on All Out. And so here's the other thing that I want to talk about is that for the fans, for the American fans that maybe aren't as familiar with Minoru Suzuki, like this is going to be awesome because I think you're going to get a treat. So if you're watching the stream and you're like, oh, I don't know Minoru Suzuki, you are in for a serious treat. Tune into Dynamite because that's going to be fantastic. And then for the people that obviously are already familiar with Minoru Suzuki, you already know what to expect. And you're already excited about it, which is why this moment felt so really good. Um, so I think I got pretty much all of what I wanted to talk about with that. But let me go ahead and see what you guys are saying here. Uh, we got a super chat from Sebastian Mikulik, who says um, 10,000 people in Chicago singing Casa uh, More. I had goosebumps. Mox living his best life. People, I can't even like, I can't even tell you guys. You had to be there. You legitimately had to be there. Because it was just, it was like in unison, like in unison where everybody just automatically knows this is a big deal. And it felt like it and it came through. And again, I don't know how this came through on television, but in person, you definitely felt this like uproar of excitement. Um, so thank you so much to Sebastian for sending in uh, this super chat here. Um, I really appreciate it. We got another one from Justin P who says, I love New Japan hard style and you can see Moxley loves this hard hitting style. It's a great style of matches to put Moxley in. Hashtag Suzuki is a badass. Yeah, that's the thing too. And that's I, what also made it like feel even more special is that, you know, John Moxley is obviously, you know, interested in having these types of matches and, you know, interested in, you know, expanding on this, you know, especially in AEW. So I think that this is like this when I talk about there being something for everybody on the show, this is one of those matches or, you know, everything that John Moxley has been doing is a perfect example of providing different different versatility for different fans and what different fans prefer. And even also introducing some of the fans, some of the newer fans or some of the fans that may be unfamiliar with that, uh, introducing them to that as well. So that's pretty cool, um, too. So thank you so much to Justin P for sending in that super chat as well. All right, um, let's get into the next match here. We had uh, Dr. Britt Baker, DMD, defending her AEW Women's Championship against Chris Statlander. She won via submission and is still the AEW Women's Champion. Here's the thing is that everybody here knew that Britt Baker was going to come out as AEW Women's Champion. I don't think there was one person here that thought, oh, maybe, just maybe, uh, Britt Baker is going to lose. But with that being said, just because we all knew that Britt Baker was going to win this match did not necessarily make Chris Statlander a weak challenger by any means because, again, going back to what I was saying earlier, she she is somebody that is likable. She is somebody that gets over with the crowd. So when you have that, when you have that interest in your talent, then people are still going to, you know, want to watch the match. They're still going to want to get excited. And there are still going to people, there are still going to be people that are going to buy these moments where you think, oh my God, what if Chris Statlander actually defeats Brett Baker? And so you saw this in this match, but I do want to take a second here and get, and put over Chris Statlander because one of the things that I really got from this match here is that she really just showed a lot of strength. She, stro she showed that she had a lot of power and I thought that was probably one of my favorite things or one of like the main things that really stood out for me from Chris Statlander during this Um it was very impressive to see. There was a moment where she like literally deadlifted um, Britt Baker uh, during the suplex spot. And there was another moment where she lifted her as well. And so it was just kind of like, it was kind of cool to see. There was a moment where the crowd were chanting, this is awesome. So the people were definitely into this. This was a fine match. Again, fine considering we all knew that Britt Baker was going to walk out um, as champion here. 
And yeah, we got a lot of DMD comments over here. Um, BTW, guys, before we move on to the next match here, uh, we got a couple more matches to talk about. But for those of you who have never tuned into my show before, heads up, I am live on here three times a week, ladies and gentlemen, three times a week. I'm live to talk about NXT on Tuesdays. I'm live to talk about Dynamite on Wednesdays. And I'm live to talk about SmackDown and AEW Rampage on Friday. So if you guys haven't tuned into the shows, tune in. They're lots of fun. They're usually just like this. We chat. We have a good time. It's really fun. Um, but let's go ahead and move on because after this, we had this was the match that I was saying, and a lot of people were saying. I know Dave and Brian were also talking about this when we did We're Live, pal. That this was the match that a lot of people were looking forward to because we all knew that the in ring work was just going to be absolutely phenomenal. And that was uh, the Lucha Brothers defeating the Young Bucks in a steel cage to become new AEW tag team champions so many of us have been talking about like oh when are the lucha brothers going to become champions when are they going to become champions it finally happened and i didn't see this coming uh, i didn't see it coming i mean maybe once the match actually started and all of that then yeah obviously we saw it coming then but like a couple of weeks ago i did not see this coming i did not realize we were you know uh prior to them announcing uh that they were that they had won the tournament I, again i thought it was going to be jurassic express in this spot so when the lucha brothers you know, made it, I was thinking to myself, like, oh my God, like, this is probably going to be the chance where they finally become AEW tag team champions. And we've talked about this. This wasn't necessarily, it didn't really feel like the story that they were telling, but they did it. They pulled the plug on the Lucha Brothers and now they're tag team champions. And I think the major thing that I want to stress in this match, guys, really, really stress this, like embed it into everybody right now. The reaction that the Lucha Brothers got when they won the titles was massive. Massive. They, I would say, got one of one of the biggest pops of the night. Okay. And I mean up there with like Brian Danielson and Adam Cole, uh, you know, debuting and all of that. Their pop winning the titles was definitely up there. There were a lot of people, like even throughout the entire match, like the second they came out and they had that like really cool entrance and everything. But throughout the match, people were just like, so I feel like out of all the matches, this was the match where I felt people were most like throughout the match, just like kind of like, Really, really hanging on to the hope that the Lucha Brothers would be winning this match. Like you felt it throughout the entire match. Like there wasn't a moment where people were like, okay, let's just wait and see when they win. There was none of that. It was kind of like, come on, come on. Like we know it's coming, that sort of thing. And you really felt that throughout the entire building. Like It was very clear. Like had they not won tonight, it was very clear that it would have been a major. And I mean, major upset during this and I mean the match itself it was what you expected you expected you know all of these insane spots from all from 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 these guys that was what we expected out of this match here but here's the other thing that I want to put over I think that you know it also establishes you know the the cage gimmick because you have you know you have this awesome match you have nobody interfere and you also have the baby faces win so i did like that as well um the only thing that i did have to critique just a little bit if i'm going to critique anything at all was i did think that the thumb thumb the thumbtack spot should have been done later on in the match I did kind of feel like it maybe dragged on for just a little bit too long especially kind of being there in the audience and kind of like making out what was happening for me it kind of felt like it went just a tad bit too long because I was like what is happening like trying to see through like the cage for the most part like I said earlier I didn't have a problem looking through the cage whatsoever but that was a moment where I kind of felt like there was a little bit of a lull there and it kind of feels like something more of that you would towards the end of this match but I mean other than that that's just nitpicking dude this match was incredible it was so much fun so many different spots here uh I mean it was insane when we saw Bray Phoenix go up to the top of the cage I was just like what the hell is he gonna do is he gonna kill himself right now like what the hell is gonna happen here and so that was a pretty cool moment during this and uh before I get into that media scrum we got a super chat from the Miguel who says FYI Lucha Bros are now the AEW and AAA tag team champions 
belt collectors. Uh, we got a super chat from Justin P who says, um, this was the right time for Lucha Bros to win fan to win fantastic match. So how do you think they will go forward with the storyline of the Lucha Brothers and Andrade? I do not know. I feel I would love to see Andrade with the Lucha Brothers. I think it would be awesome. That's still kind of like what I want to see. But I don't know when it's going to happen or if it's going to happen. I do not know. But that is something that I personally would want to see. And uh, let's see what else we got here. I'm going to go through a couple more of these comments here. Um, okay, let me get into the actual media scrum here. So the Lucha Brothers were part of the media scrum. And I would say, aside from, Ru I, I would say that aside from Ruby Soho, they were probably the most, um, they showed just how much it meant to them to be tag team champions. Like, I'm trying to like put it into words because like, you know, hearing about it is one thing and even watching the video, like you can tell, but even just like being there in person and, you know, kind of getting like a closer look into like their eyes. Cause you know, they have their mask and everything. So it does shield a lot of that emotion from their face, but just kind of like, even like I was taking a second to like look into their eyes as they were talking to like members of the media and even just like hearing their voice and hearing what they had to say. I mean, Ray Phoenix, was kind of lost for words like he didn't know what to say like there I forgot what somebody asked him like kind of like what this meant to him or something like that and he literally like he was trying to like find the perfect things to say but the emotion that they were feeling was just so strong that they couldn't necessarily like put it into words and you can tell like you can legitimately tell that they were just like so thankful and even like I I talked about this like that was one of my questions to to the Lucha Brothers well my question to them was essentially like knowing the fact that they were out there uh you know selling stuff outside of Arena Mexico and they were you know essentially just trying to make it and now they're here knowing all of the struggles and everything that they went through to get to this point in their careers like what does this mean to them and so he didn't Penta basically started talking to me about like, you know, selling masks outside for people sleeping on the metro, just trying to make it and, you know, just kind of going through all of that to get to this point. And you could really hear it in his voice when he was talking to me like, hey, this is a big deal. And you really got that from them from them that like, you really, really did. Uh, I don't think I could stress that enough. And so um, good stuff, man, guys, really, really good stuff. Like, I, I don't know what else to say about that. Really good stuff. Uh, we got a comment from Hibumaro who says, Lucha Brothers been killing it since day one at AEW. Actually, you just reminded me of uh, the other thing that I want. Two more things that I needed to add. Thank you. I almost forgot this. So um, one of the other things that they also mentioned in the media scrum was if Tony Khan approves of this. And I, I didn't get to look at Tony Khan's face during this because um, – his, view, his face was kind of obstructed from my view, so I really couldn't read his face or see what his reaction to this was. Um, but the Lucha Brothers said that they want to do a hair versus a uh, mask match someday, someday against the Young Bucks. So that's something that they want to do in AEW. Now they didn't say uh, uh, they didn't they didn't say like when or even if it's possible, but I think they were kind of like. I think this was them shooting their shot with Tony Khan right there and kind of like putting this idea in his head. And I'm so kind of bummed that I didn't get it. Like I'm upset at myself for not like, you know, trying to find a way to see Tony Khan's reaction. And I'm going to check to see if maybe somebody else's video captured his reaction. But I wanted, I wanted to see his facial reaction when they said that because I was curious as to, you know, if he liked the idea or if he didn't like the idea, you were going to be able to tell by his uh, reaction when they said it. And then the other thing that I wanted to get at too is that like even after that scrum, I can't even tell you, like they were so happy. They were like all hugging and just like being so thankful to Tony for this opportunity. And like, I can't, I really can't say this enough. Like they were just like so happy, so happy. All right, I'm going to move on guys. Um, Oh my gosh, we still have so much to talk about. Okay, I'm going to kind of speed through this for a second here. Um, let's jump into the Casino Battle Royale, uh, bro, Battle Royale. Um, the Women's Casino Battle Royale. Winner to face Britt Baker. Uh, Ruby Soho ended up winning that, as you guys all know. We've talked about her quite a bit on this stream so far. Um, in the beginning, when this match um, 
started, I thought that it was a bad spot to put the women in because I was like, man, you're going to you're going to have them follow up like that tag team match like this is insane. But I think and then I will say this, though, a lot of people left during this match. Like I kept seeing like a bunch of people just like leaving because people needed to go to the bathroom. People were hungry. People were trying to find moments throughout the show to like get a little bit of a break. And so this was a match that sadly, a lot of people kind of left during this. But then but then towards the end, like a lot of people were already back in their seats. So they didn't really miss like the Ruby Soho uh, Thunder Rosa interaction. But like throughout the Casino Battle Royal, like the beginning, like a lot of people did leave during that. Um, So I kind of felt like it was a bad spot for them. But then given that it's a Battle Royale and, you know, you have all these people, come, these all these people coming out, all these women coming out, I feel like no matter what, you're going to get like that nice like reaction, that nice pop from the crowd because people are excited to see, you know, all of these like, you know, wrestlers coming out. So people were excited for that. Um, One of the people that I was a little bit surprised, not a surprise, but they're the reaction to this person kind of um, surprised me a little bit. Surprised me, but like in a good way was Abaddon. I wasn't expecting her pop to be as loud as it was. And it honestly stood out to me. Like I was like, oh shit. Like I didn't realize how much people like loved Abaddon. I was kind of thrown back a little bit. Um, but either way, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, throughout this battle royale, uh, we did have a portion of the chant of the crowd. I don't know if you could hear this on TV, but we had a portion of the crowd chanting, we want Tessa, uh, Tessa Blanchard. And then you had another portion of the crowd reacting to that and basically saying, no, we don't. And that kind of went on for a little while where you were hearing, we want Tessa. No, we don't. And I was like, oh, wow. Like, um, that was a little bit interesting to kind of like hear that throughout this match here. Um, the actual Battle Royal, I thought was okay. I did think some of the fans favorites got eliminated too early like I didn't even see when Riho got eliminated I didn't even see who eliminated her at anything because all I just heard was Justin Roberts announced Riho has been eliminated and I was like what when did this happen and I'm watching the match keep in mind but you know there's obviously so much going on you're not you know always looking at the right point point um also, the other thing that I was surprised at during this battle royale was Nyla essentially eliminating Jade Cargill. I do not think that this was necessarily the best option. And the reason for that is Jade Cargill has been so protected on AEW. Like you can tell they're shaping her up to be a big star. Obviously, she's still a little green, but she's been improving as she's, you know, you know, as she's gotten more, you know, matches underneath her belt and all of that. And, you know, she has a great physique, a great look, a great attitude and all of that. So, you know, they're planning on making her a big star. So I was not I didn't think that it was the right call to have Nyla just eliminate her the way that she did. I kind of felt that it happened so sudden, so abruptly. And I hope that they follow up on it. I don't know if they will. I hope that they do, because if not, it's kind of like, why would you do that? Why would you just have her eliminate her like that? If anything, Jade Cargill could have easily been one of the like final four women in this battle royal. Um, same thing with Anna J. Like given the fact that she just returned, I thought they could have also had her in the final four. Uh, you know, just again, because she had just returned. Give her a little bit of like, you know, some like steam during this. Um Finally, we get that Joker spot. It's Ruby Soho. Everybody loses their mind. We kind of already talked about this. She gets a very, very nice reaction, a very nice welcome from the people. And then uh, she ends up being the final person along with Thunder Rosa. And I'm thinking to myself, holy cow, Thunder Rosa in the ring right now with Ruby Soho. And they have like this stare down between each other. And the crowd is sort of torn, guys. Like we got 50-50. We got people essentially saying like, we want Ruby. Then we got other people cheering for Thunder Rosa. Like this felt very cool because you could kind of tell that there was a little bit of divide in the audience and who they actually wanted to see uh, get over during this. Although we all knew that it had to be Ru Ruby Soho. And given the fact that she's coming in with so much momentum, this this is a moment where you capitalize on that. And that is exactly what they did. They capitalized on, you know, her momentum, her debut and having her win uh, this opportunity. So I thought this was great. I love the way that they did this. It was a really feel good moment. Everybody was happy for her. Uh, even the people that obviously were like cheering for Thunder Rosa. Uh, they were cheering for Thunder Rosa because they liked Thunder Rosa. But at the same time, it's like they were still obviously happy for Ruby Soho. So it wasn't like anybody was upset or anything like that. And again, you know, we already talked a little bit about what she 
said in the media scrum, but essentially she talks about, you know, she was sad to leave WWE. Uh, she felt bad because, you know, she had made so many lifelong friends there and she wanted to be around those people, but she knew that she knew she was moving on to the next chapter in her life. And then she also talked about wanting to come to AEW right away. The second she got her release, she was like, okay, AEW is the place that I want to go to, but she didn't know if there was a spot for her there. And so that was one of the things that she talked about. I asked Ruby, I asked her, I'm like, hey, everybody brings something different to the table. What are you going to bring or what do you hope to bring to the AEW women's division? And she basically said that selfishly, like her selfish answer was that she wanted to have like these like incredible matches with these women, like matches that even maybe she that even maybe she may be surprised that she's having in the first place. Like she's really looking to put in some really good in-ring work. And she just basically talked about, you know, trying to get more, uh, you know, trying to elevate the AEW women's division. So I thought that was a pretty uh, perfectly fine answer that she gave there. Um, so yeah, that was good stuff for her. She was very, very happy, guys. Like I said, she got emotional. It was great. Um, okay, here we go, guys. We got a super chat from Justin P who says, um, what do you think of the future of Sky Blue? I mean, I think that given the way that she got brought into this match, uh, you know, she was very over with the Chicago audience. I wasn't there because I was at GCW, but I read about it and everybody was talking about it. At the GCW show, so many people were like, oh, did you hear about Sky Blue? Did you hear about Sky Blue? And I was like, oh, yeah, like I heard about it. So like, even if you didn't hear about it, people were talking about it and how she essentially, you know, Tony Khan gave her this spot. Um, I thought they could have kept her in the match a lot longer, too. Like, she's over with the Chicago crowd. She's from Chicago. Have her stay in there a little bit longer. Give her a little something there. But, I mean, obviously, her being in there was, like, a big moment. Um, so, I feel like – I feel like uh, – and actually – Tony Khan did talk about this in the media scrum. I don't remember verbatim what he said, but he did talk about Sky Blue and he did say that they're going to use her more. Uh, but I don't remember exactly what he said, but that was that was I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing right now what he said about that. Um, alrighty guys. So here we go. Uh, let's get into this next match because we got MJF versus Chris Jericho. MJF defeating Chris Jericho. This was the match that if Chris Jericho lost his in-ring career with AEW would be over. Uh, his career with in his in-ring career with AEW is no longer over. He's still going to be wrestling because he won this, uh, he won this, uh, Excuse me. Why did I say MJF defeated Chris Jericho? My bad. I meant to play Chris Jericho defeated MJF. Uh, that was a typo. Um, pardon the typo, guys. I'm running on very low sleep here. Um, but okay, let's talk about this actual um, this actual everything that went down. So first and foremost, shout out to MJF, man, because that entrance where they had the countdown clock, the Chris Jericho countdown clock, and everybody's thinking I didn't I didn't fall for it. MJF, I did not fall for it. And for a fact, it was MJF. But anyways, maybe for like a second, I did think we were going to see Chris Jericho, but for like a very tiny second, I knew it was MJF. But he did swerve amid, like pretty much everybody in that building because everybody thought like, oh, Jericho's going to come out to the countdown clock, how cool, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but instead, uh, all of a sudden on the screen, you just start to see uh, – you just start to see like words flash on the screen where it says that it's his last match and everybody knows it's MJF. And then we see MJF coming out here. I thought this was really funny. Really, really funny. Um, the Jericho entrance, I do kind of wish that they would just play the music because it was a little bit awkward, like being in the audience. And like people are trying to find like the right spot to like start singing in. I thought that was a little bit awkward. But for the most part, like once you got to the actual like chorus and all of that, uh, people were having a good time singing it. But I think it would have just been better just to like play the actual song. Uh, the match itself, guys, it was fine. I thought the crowd was into it. I think this is another one of those matches where like it really is the crowd that elevated this match. And I think just made this match feel that much more special. Um, as for the finish, which is kind of the thing that people wanted to talk about here because I personally thought that MJF should have won this match. I really did think that MJF should have won this. And I think that the way that they did it, uh, I didn't, I was not a fan of this. So let me tell you essentially what we got here. We had MJF, he gets the pin on Jericho, but Jericho's foot is on the rope. But, uh, but the referee, she doesn't see it. Okay, so she doesn't see that his foot is on the rope. And so then we get another referee and they start talking. I don't know what they're saying because I can't hear what's happening. Um, so then they end up restarting this match. So I did not like that. I did not like that because I didn't think that anybody bought 
this is how Chris Jericho's career in ring AW, his AW in ring career is going to end. Nobody bought, okay, this is it. Everybody was like, okay, kind of like move on. Like we all know something's going to happen. Just kind of get with it. So nobody fell for that. Like it wasn't a moment where like, Everybody was like fooled or anything like that. It was just like, all right, we all know he got his foot on the rope. Let's get to it. Let's get to like the real finish here. Um, I didn't like this. I thought that they uh, they made Aubrey look bad by giving her this spot here where she essentially misses it. And it just makes her look bad. Um, I did not like that. And then also given the fact that we had a similar uh, not a similar situation, but a somewhat similar situation with the Miro Eddie Kingston match, which I talked about earlier and having the, uh, you know, essentially the, uh, Bryce Remsburg take some of the heat for uh, not getting that, uh, not counting that pin for Eddie Kingston and then having this play out in this match. I didn't like that. There was two matches that essentially had um, something similar like this happen with the, uh, with the referee and all of that, but the match gets restarted guys. And um, I think it kind of got like a little bit better after this. Like once we got restarted, people were like, okay, cool. Like now let's get to the real finish. So I thought, here was what I thought was going to happen. I thought they were going to swerve us. So I thought, okay, Jericho got his foot on the rope. So MJF does not win this match. Great. I thought that they were going to restart it and they did. But once they restarted it, I was expecting for them to kind of like find a different way for MJF to be like, yeah, so what? I'm still winning this match. Like, I thought had they still had MJF win it, I thought it would have been, like, a lot better to tell the story. But it just, I didn't like this guy. So, like, uh, Jericho ends up blocking in the Lion Tamer uh, to force the tap. I think the only reason uh, I wasn't completely sold on this was because by him doing the Lion Tamer here and, you know, uh, using both of the arms, it kind of no-sold the Fujiwara off. The Fuji, the Fujiwara arm bar from earlier, I kind of thought that it kind of, kind of no sold that. And then also no sold, you know, that arm that he has been dealing with since, uh, since, uh, the arm that, he, that has been busted ever since he got thrown off the cage. So I kind of felt like that was a little bit like the ending didn't really make sense. And then also they had MJF took a while to actually tap out. I thought it would have been a lot better had he actually tapped out right away, especially given that he's a heel and given his character, I think it would have made more sense for him to tap out right away. So, um, and it would have drawn more heat too while I'm at it. Had, had, MJF tapped out right away it would have drawn more heat because people want to see MJF suffer and taking that away from them taking that away from the crowd would essentially like piss them off so I do I didn't think this was like my favorite match of the night but there were definitely some fun fun moments the finish was a little bit wonky and I did see a lot of people were like oh some people like this finish some people didn't I thought it was for the most part it was okay I would have probably just finessed a couple of things there um so here we go um, let's see what else we got here. Uh, let me go through a couple more comments here. See what you guys are saying. Uh, we got so many different comments, guys. Uh, we got one from R. Riggs who says, I don't like when a referee comes back to correct a call. That was not that. The ref came out because of Wardlow and Hager, so he was actually already a ringside. Made more sense. Ricky says finish was like uh, what we see in WWE. And yeah, it was definitely something where uh, this is something where you would definitely see uh, in WWE. Yeah, it felt very WWE-esque. Um, we got a super chat from Sebastian who says, Bryce Remsburg, the new Tirantes, and thinking Mark. <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking too. Yeah, it's something, definitely thinking the exact same thing. Uh, I'm not a fan of it. I'm not, a, I'm not totally a fan of it. I'm not a fan of it. Uh, but thank you so much, Sebastian, for sending in a super chat here. Um, all right, guys, here we go. Uh, we got a couple more matches to get into. Uh, CM Punk, Darby Allen. Uh, CM Punk wins via pinfall. And here's the thing. I, I was talking about this on my prediction show, how I was essentially completely like torn apart here where I didn't really know. I didn't really know what the finish should be here. I was a little bit torn. Like part of me, like I think my final prediction was like that Darby Allen would win. But once like I actually got to the venue and you know, you had CM Punk coming out and everybody was so excited. I was so excited, just like screaming my head off and everything. And then, you know, you have Darby coming out. You have this like 
them being in the ring together, everybody's just like, okay, this is officially happening. Like, this is the match that people were really, really looking forward to. So people were just very, very excited. And it was very cool to, like, kind of be a part of, like, the big CM Punk, like, Chicago entrance. Like, it was felt very cool to be there. Um, but anyway, so, um, you know, CM Punk comes out. He's wearing tights. I like this too. I like this because it kind of feels like a new chapter. Um, so I'm, I like that we're seeing him in tights after this. Darby, even though Darby lost, dude, he's a made man. He is a made man after this match. Like everything that he's been doing, you know, like I mentioned earlier, that strong TNT title reign, you know, his his his, his alliance with Sting, you know, having the first match with, with CM Punk. I mean, dude, the guy is made, guys. Um, this was a fun match because I kind of felt that it was cool to see CM Punk, not just in the ring with Darby Allen, but obviously, you know, Darby Allen's a lot younger. He's going to move a lot faster, but there was not a moment in this match where I felt like CM Punk looked off whatsoever. I genuinely felt that he was able to keep up with Darby Allen. And there was always like these moments where like Darby would just move so fast, but CM Punk was always in the right spot always where he needed to be. And what you saw in this match is you saw Darby essentially, uh, you saw Darby hit all of his signature Darby moves and CM Punk took them all perfectly. He was in the right spots, everything. He took them great. I mean, there, again, he was not out of beat in this whatsoever. And given that he hasn't wrestled in seven years and the fact that you can tell that they were building for a pretty lengthy match, that's not easy to train for. Like, I can't imagine that it's easy to train for, a, to, to build to a long match the way that they did. And they did it. And it was exciting. And people were into it. And people were interested in, like, how, you know, CM Punk was going to react to this, how he was going to react to that. There was a moment where uh, Darby Allen goes for the coffin drop and, uh, CM Punk is like laying there, right? And then, you know, Darby's all confident, you know, going for that coffin drop and he does it and CM Punk like just sits up and he kind of gives like this nod uh, to the camera and essentially it's kind of like, haha, like you really thought that I was just going to lay there and take the coffin drop? I thought that was really cool because it was kind of like a nod to him studying up Darby Allen and Darby Allen and knowing that that was going to come. And so I thought that was really good stuff here. Um, I'm trying to think if there was anything else I wanted to say. Definitely the right call having CM Punk win. Um, did not take anything away from Darby Allen. The people loved it. People lost their minds. It was very fun. Um, all righty, guys. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Let me see if we get any more comments here that I want to read. Uh, we got a lot of people basically saying that they loved uh, the coffin drop spot. People really enjoyed that. Uh, Morbid478 says that Darby ring post, ring post spot was gruesome. It was. It really, really was. Um, and here's the thing. So somebody's bringing up that he used a chin, uh, that he was using a chin lock and all of this. Guys, like, yeah, you saw a little bit more rest holds during this match. But dude, like, I just feel that based on the match that they were doing, based on the fact that he hasn't wrestled for seven years, I thought this was perfectly fine, guys. I thought this was perfectly fine. Uh, I didn't have a problem with him using more rest holds during this match. Um, let's see what else we got here. We got a super chat from Speed Punk who says, hey, it's uh, Denise from the Signs at All Out. They can't mute her. She's bringing us the news we need. Uh, thank you guys so much. It really was cool to see somebody with a mute Denise sign. Uh, that was pretty exciting. Really, really exciting. Thank you so much to Speed Punk for sending in this super chat. And um, all righty, guys, here we go. I'm going through a couple more comments. Uh, no CM Punk and Darby did not main event, but it was perfectly fine. Uh, let's see what else we got here. We got a comment from D. Eddie who says, uh, technical wrestling lockups made sense. It was something different on the card. And yeah, I did not have a problem with this match whatsoever. And everybody really loved that CM Punk spot where he rises up before the coffin drop. Yes, Taker-esque vibes for sure. Taker, Undertaker vibes for sure. All right, here we go. And uh, let's go ahead and move on, guys. So BTW, after this, we had Paul White defeating QT Marshall. Uh, please do not hate me, ladies and gentlemen, but this was uh, the moment where I left because I had to go to the bathroom. So I did not watch any of this match. Sorry, guys. Unfortunately, I had to pick a moment. Uh, I couldn't miss anything else. I was dying. 
I, I wanted to go for like the longest time. And when I saw that CM Punk and Darby were next, I was like, oh my God, I can't leave now. So like the, I knew that after this match, they were going to do Paul White and QT Marshall. So I was like, screw it. Sorry. That's going to have to be my bathroom break. And it was. So unfortunately, I have nothing to say about this match. Uh, I will give you guys some nice tidbits, though. Everybody went to the bathroom. I mean, not everybody, but a lot of people did. There were lines. There were lines in the women's bathroom. There's never lines in the women's, rest uh, women's bathroom for wrestling shows. I usually just walk in, walk out. I actually waited in a line. I was so pissed. But everybody went to the bathroom, unfortunately. <laughs> um, also, there was a lot of people that were like running to like get to um, the merchandise section. When I got there, uh, when I left during that match, like as soon as the match, as soon as I realized that they were going to do this match, I left right away. And I was like rushing up the stairs, right? And um, they had, uh, there was five people in the merchandise line. I was so pissed because I left my wallet back at the, t at the seat. I was like, damn it. Had I brought my wallet, I would have gotten in line right now. I would have gotten my damn CM Punk shirt. And then I would have been back before this match ended. But I forgot my wallet. I left it in my seat. So I couldn't necessarily get the merch. So I was a little upset. But I was like, all right, whatever. Because any other point, any other point, there was a long merch line, long merch lines, long food lines. There was a bunch of people there. So like I knew for a fact I wasn't going to buy any merch because there was just too many lines, uh, too much of a long line. But anyways, uh, let's get into this main event, ladies and gentlemen, the AEW World Championship match. We had Kenny Omega uh, defeating Christian Cage here. Um, I'll be honest, guys. I was a little bit burnt out by the point that we got here by the by the time we had this match here, I was definitely a little bit tired here, guys. Um, I I don't know if it, I don't know if like the entire I kind of feel like a big portion of the crowd was a little bit tired by the time we got to this match. And I here's the thing though is that Kenny Omega and Christian Cage Christian Cage had a really good match. Like they had the match that you were expecting us to have, and I just got to say that this was a great this is a great worked match, and also. Christian Cage did some really good selling in here. He really sold those V triggers where I would probably even go as far as to say he's one of the best. Uh, he's one of the best at selling right now in AEW. Like it was just good stuff all around there. But I think a lot of the people at this point in the show were like burnt out, maybe a little tired. Um, and then second and then like third of all, I think a lot of the people were kind of just like waiting to see what the surprises were going to be. Because again, we all knew we were going to have these surprises, but it was just one of those things where I feel like people were just sort of waiting for the, for the surprises to happen. So I did kind of think that did take a little bit um, from the match. And then, I mean, that was bound to happen. But yeah, people were tired. I was a little tired. Um, so here we go, guys, the surprises. After the match, we had Kenny Omega uh, basically say that no one could beat him, said people who, who could aren't there or they're retired or they're dead, which was essentially a nod to Adam Cole uh, being killed off in the elite when he signed uh, with NXT. So then the lights go out, and that was obviously when he said that a lot of people knew that it was going to be Adam Cole. The lights go out, and then you have Adam Cole coming out People just lost their minds, guys. This was very, very exciting to see. Um, it was kind of like, oh, shoot. Like, he really did make the decision to go on over to AEW. And from what I got on the Post Media Scrum, from, from listening to him talk about the decision-making process, it seemed to me like even though he had, you know, he respected his time in WWE and, you know, he respected the people that he worked with and all of that, it, he didn't seem, he didn't have anything bad to say, obviously. But he also made it seem like it was very, it was a very, very easy decision to go to go on over to AEW. I feel like it wasn't a decision that was hard for him to make. So that was a little bit interesting. And um, so anyway, so he comes out and, uh, you know, he gets in Kenny Omega's face, but then he ends up turning around and hitting Jungle Boy with a super kick uh, before a, uh, before celebrating with the elite. So now you have uh, Adam Cole joining the elite. And all I got to say is this is going to be very, very cool because there is just so much there. Okay, so this is this is so much better. Like, I'm so glad that like, you know, he joined the elite here because he, you know, he works so much better as a heel. They already have so much history there. So they don't have to force anything. And like, 
I feel a lot of us can safely predict that maybe this alliance will last, I don't know, six to a, six months to like a year, whatever the case may be. You know, you're, they're going to have that go for a little while. But you know that down the line, someone is bound to turn on somebody. And down the line, we're going to get that Adam Cole, uh, Kenny Omega match. And that is going to be very, very fun. So I just kind of felt like seeing all of this was very, very cool. Um and yeah, the dynamic on Dynamite is going to be even more awesome. And here's another thing that I want to add. Uh, you know, having this like heel Adam Cole is that he has a lot of strong baby faces to work with. Literally just like to name a few, you have Darby Allen, you have Hangman Page, you have CM Punk, you have Jungle Boy. Jungle Boy who was in the ring with all of these like big name guys. Uh, Jungle Boy is definitely one of those, those guys that is in a really good position right now on AEW. Um, so just to name a few, I feel like there's so much that you can do with Adam Cole. I do think this was a big loss for WWE because they really could have used them. Uh, they could have used them in a different way. They could have used them in the main event scene on the, you know, on Raw or on SmackDown, whatever the case may be, they could have definitely done that. Um, so here we go. So I thought, guys, I'll be honest, at this point, I thought that that was it. I thought the show was going to be over. I was like, all right, cool. The show's in. Awesome. I had a good time. Awesome. You know, I, I was ready to call it a day. I was like, all right, this is cool. I had a good time, you know, on to the interviews and then go to sleep. All right. But then just as I thought that things were over, they were not over. They were not over. All of a sudden, we have Brian Danielson, um, the music hits, and he comes out and people, guys, that reaction for Brian was absolutely phenomenal it was like when adam cole came out i was so happy but i was like okay i'm gonna tweet that he's here blah 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 when brian danielson came out i was like screw my twitter account i'm just gonna celebrate i'm just gonna cheer i'm just gonna get so happy and i was just like screaming and hollering and i think i was like i forgot what i was yelling i remember what i was saying but it was just one of those things where instead of like focusing on social media and putting the word out there. I was like so lost in the moment because that is how major it felt like it, it felt so important that he had appeared on the show that I was like, not caring about like having to like tweet or anything like that. I just really wanted to like soak in the moment. And so that felt really cool there. Uh, so he gets an insane pop. He comes down. He does the baby face save for Jurassic Express and Christian Cage. And then um, I believe that's how it ends on TV. But afterwards, the crowd got an extra bonus, which I'll talk about in just a second. So we got a super chat from Speed Punk who says uh, they got two of the original Ring of Honor roster on AEW now uh, jack evans and danielson my childhood coming back now if they get low-key i'll throw my wallet at tony <laughs> um thank you so much speed punk for sending in the super chat uh and that awesome uh visual of you just tossing your wallet take my wallet take my money take my bank account um all right um, so after this, he essentially does, you know, a promo to the audience and he thanks them uh, off the top of my head. I'm trying to remember everything that he said, but he basically just said that the reason why he's there again, he talks about the talent, but he kind of he, he kind of shifts it a little bit. He does something a little bit different because CM Punk talked a lot about the young talent, but Brian Danielson talked more about. Um, the original members of AEW or like the people that were there uh, for the er like in the early days of AEW because they were the ones that essentially helped get it to the point where it needs to be. He points out names like, um, he points out Chris Jericho's name. He brings up John Moxley's name and a few others that I'm blanking on right now. But, you know, he kind of puts over those people because they were the ones who essentially helped grow AEW to what it needed to be. And then he also says, you know, I know people are going to boo me right now or I know people are going to be upset with me, but I want you guys to know that I loved my job in WWE, I loved where I work in WWE, but you know, I'm here now because, you know, I love pro wrestling and he just kept saying pro wrestling, pro wrestling over and over again. He was like, I'm a pro wrestler and I want to put out, uh, I want to produce the most brilliant pro wrestling, uh, here in AEW. And then he started saying like, you know, the other reason why I wanted to come to AEW was because of the fans, because you guys are the best fans in the world. And so he was kind of going off about that for like a while. And then afterwards he ends up closing, he ends up closing it out with um, AEW let's effing go. Uh, so it was a really, really cool and very 
honest. He was very honest. Like he knew that some that the AEW crowd wasn't gonna love the line about him being a WWE, about him having a uh, you know, love and respect for his former employer. They knew that he knew that they weren't necessarily gonna react to that, but him being so honest about that and so open about that, I think to me felt more real than and if he would have just came out and been like, yeah, you know, I didn't like where I worked at before. No, he had a different experience, you know, and he and he and he and he talked about his experience. He didn't try to be anybody else. He didn't try to be CM Punk because CM Punk had a different experience. CM Punk had a different experience. Uh, Brian Danielson had a different experience and he spoke about his own experience. So I really like that. I was a fan of that. And I just thought that it felt really, really good to see him out there and just, you know, talking to everybody the way that he was. Uh, we got a super chat from Ryan Cordes who says, um, what about that closing shot of Brian, Christian Cage, Luchasaurus, Luchasaurus and Jungle Boy celebrating? So cool to see the growth in Jurassic Express since 2019. Dude, I mean, there's somebody that like AEW did such a great job at building up Jurassic Express. Like I said, they are loved, man. It was clear from the very beginning. And again, I'm circling back to Jungle Boy. This is a guy who had an awesome match against Kenny Omega. Uh, you know, he's been put in these like positions uh, on AEW where you're like, all right. He, they they definitely see something in him. So it is really cool to sort of see that um, and see who they're aligning with, who they're aligning him with on these shows. Um, so thank you so much to Ryan for sending in uh, that super chat. And um, thank you so much. Labor Day sends in a transcription here of what he says. Uh, this is from Brian Danielson's promo after the show. Uh, he says, I'm a pro wrestler. I took pro wrestling with me every went, everywhere I went. I said pro wrestling, even when I shouldn't have. There you go. That is exactly what Brian Danielson said. So like I said, he definitely, um, he really put that over. Um, <laughs> then Cass is pointing out that I did 90 minutes on today's show. Guys, there's just so much to talk about. The live experience, the app, the whole entire everything. Guys, that is the show. Thank you so much. Um, I hope I answered all of your questions. I'm sure I'll probably think of something that I did not say. And I'm probably gonna be like, damn it, I forgot to say this. But just so much happened. Uh, the experience was great being at, you know, in Chicago for All Out. It was so much fun. Um, I can't wait to do it again, guys. And I just want to say thank you so much to everybody who tuned into the show. Please, guys, please head on over to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Denise Salcedo. If you want to watch this post media scrums that I've been talking about nonstop, go and check those out right there. Other than that, have an awesome day. I'll see you guys later. Bye, everybody.